Good morning. So just by way of introduction of um, who I am, um, I'm a software engineer. I've been working in IT for nigh on 15 odd years. Uh, I've been focused particularly on cloud in the last few years. Um, big proponent of open source technologies, contributed to Postgres, Terraform, and another one called YAL. And uh, I focus particularly on data. Uh, so I help our customers move their data into the cloud and make good use of, of their data, which of course is where machine learning comes in. So the key thing about me is that I like to think that I know data. So what we're going to cover here, we're going to talk about what is machine learning, uh, what the machine learning stack in AWS is, go through some use cases, and then in particular I'm going to focus on what I call the forgotten service, machine learning. So one thing to be mindful of whenever you're doing anything with machine learning is ethics. That plays a major role. There's a things like bias and so on. I'm not going to sort of delve into that myself. I'm just going to bury my head in the sand here and just kind of gloss over it. But just be mindful. If you're doing machine learning, ethics is almost certainly going to come into it. So what is machine learning? Hollywood likes to present the image of the machines, which always win. Um, you know, we got our Cylons, we got our Terminators. Um, but that kind of general artificial intelligence is a very, very long way off. And uh, that's part of why we actually talk about machine learning independent of artificial intelligence. Uh, machine learning itself divides kind of into three broad categories, which in kind of nice fractal form there go off into other things, mainly supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Each of these have different approaches to the data. If supervised learning, you have a data set where you know historically what you want to predict, and so using that you try and then predict the future. With unsupervised learning, you have a bunch of data that you don't really know what the shape of that is, and you apply these various algorithms to try and tease out patterns and such. And with reinforcement learning, uh, that's where we have things making guesses, getting feedback, and repeating. Game intelligence is particularly with robots and things like the Deep Racer, that's really where reinforcement learning is currently having fun. So there's a few key concepts with machine learning. We've got these mathematical models, uh, which uh, you know, have a, it's an equation of a solution space approximating the outputs for given inputs. We've got feature engineering, how we get more and more features out of our data, and we do training. But most of us are not mathematicians or statisticians, we're just engineers. And the nice thing about AWS is that we can do a lot of stuff with machine learning without having to go into the raw mathematics behind it. So machine learning, as, a, as sort of uh, AWS put it, this is a slide from reInvent last year. There's a lot of different services on here. They talk about AI services, ML services, and ML frameworks. But I like to divide it up into cooking. We've got ready-to-eat stuff, we've got part-baked, and we've got raw ingredients. So depending on what you're trying to do, you can either, if you just want to get going, we'll start with the ready-made stuff, or if you want to delve into those models, that's where we get into our, our raw ingredients. So our ready-to-eat services. This is stuff like comprehend, translate, recognition, text extract. These are things where there's an API, there's a machine learned model behind it, but all you need to do is invoke the API, either providing it an image in the case of recognition or providing it text in the case of translate, and you get the, the answer back. You get that translation or you get the objects extracted from the image. Um, you just get to use it. You don't have to do anything else. And there's a lot of really nifty things you can do, particularly around accessibility. So for example, you could provide audio descriptions for images that you've got on your website if you're, say, a e-commerce platform. So your user interacts with the website, clicks on a particular image, a Lambda function, talks to recognition image, extracts all the objects that are in there, and then through Poly, you can describe what's being seen. A more quirky kind of use is perhaps to solve a Sudoku puzzle. So you take an image of an unsolved puzzle, put that in an S3 bucket. Again, a lambda function, extract the text in the image. So here we are. Here's a Sudoku puzzle. This is a picture taken from a webcam on my laptop. And I've extracted the puzzle from that. And off we go. We can then quickly solve the puzzle. Now, if you're interested in that, you can have a play. It's available there. It's, I won't make any uh, claims to being a great graphic designer, but it works. Um, there's also a GitHub link there so that you can go and explore the code. 
Um, there's an API gateway. You just there's some Terraform code there that you can run, which will stand up that API gateway. Handful of Lambda functions, which are written in Go, which then make use of the recognition service. And so you can see that end-to-end -end process of how these things hook together. Uh, the URL will come up again later on. So the next piece is the part-baked services. Um, the two big ones that have gone GA this year are Personalize and Forecast. Now with these services, you have to have data to augment the models that Amazon have built. So both of these have come out of the work that they've done with their own data. Uh, so Personalize, if you've used their website at all, you'll be very familiar with that. People who've bought this have also bought these things or recommended for you. There's a few different places where this comes up in different shapes and forms. And with both of these, what you do is you format your data into a particular uh, setup. So there is in the documentation a description of the, the format that you need to apply. In the case of Personalize, you have a, uh, essentially a catalog of products, uh, a list of users and the products they've bought. That then goes off and builds up a recommendation engine where you can then go and make those, those inferences. But as I said earlier, there's this kind of forgotten service which is Amazon Machine Learning. There's actually a service called Amazon Machine Learning. You won't see it, there's no new icon, it's still the old icon, um, but it, it is there. And this again requires you to add your own data. Now, give you a scenario. Who's been on the receiving end of one of these? A pager or pager duty app? A handful of you, okay. So for the benefit of those who haven't been on the end of a pager, if you've had any experience with a small baby, in the middle of the night, these things go off, and you get woken up, there's a bit of an adrenaline rush, and I can tell you, having several children of my own, that uh, rebooting a baby is no different than changing a nappy on the server at 3 a.m. So, picture a scenario, our engineer is sound asleep, alarm goes off, it's whatever inconvenient time of the night, wide awake, and immediately it clears. Nothing more frustrating than that an incident that's resolved before you've even managed to get your legs out of bed. And you know, this is a scenario we see. This one here uh, actually resolved in about 50 seconds. Steve, I'm going to guess, was still awake and actually managed to acknowledge that incident before it resolved within those, those 50 seconds. But 12, 12 a.m., a lot of engineers are still awake at that time, but some do like their sleep at that hour. Uh, and so, you know, can we use machine learning to solve this problem? Can we predict what incidents are going to resolve um, before an engineer is realistically going to do something to change that? So, pager duty, we can get an extract of all uh, the historic incidents. Uh, apologies, I've had to redact some stuff because there's customer information in there. But you can get a feel here. We get a bunch of different data, some incident identifiers, some services that we use. There's uh, time to resolve um, various different sort of attributes in there. And with the machine learning service, we can put a CSV into an S3 bucket, or indeed we can read the data out of Redshift if we so choose. Uh, we just go into here and say, there's my CSV. Reads it in. Um, the one thing to note, you can say whether you've got column headings or not. Um, and it will then help you essentially identify the, the schema. So you can say that this particular value is just text, or this is a, a categorical variable, um, or it's a, a numeric variable. Now these things are important to the algorithms. The text ones will basically be ignored. There's nothing it can do with those. Uh, with categorical variables, it will use that as part of the model. Uh, there's various techniques to represent that as numbers that models then, then use. Uh, and the nice thing is that this is a really fast way to see whether your data has something worthwhile before you go and invest time in a kind of a, a full data science program to build a full out model. Eventually, you pick a particular attribute that you're trying to, to predict, and there's uh, three different options you've got here. You can go for what's called a regression, where you've got a number that you're trying to predict, so the algorithm is going to uh, essentially choose a number within the range for that particular variable, or two types of uh, categorical <coughs> options. One is a simple binary, uh, sort of is it this or is it not, and one which is kind of multiple options, really sort of the same thing, just more than two choices. Once you've selected it, um, it will pick whether, which type of uh, algorithm to apply, and it will then go off and train the model for you. 
Once you've got that, you can then see how it does. It'll, it'll take some of the data that you've given it, carve it up, use some for training, and use some for validation, and you'll get an idea of how accurate this is. Uh, and indeed, if you find that it's you know, less than 50%, so it's no better than random coin flip, then perhaps this data doesn't have something that's predictable. Uh, but if you get something higher than that, if you're really lucky and you get something in the 90s, you've got a model that's ready to use. If not, you're going to just need to do some more work on it. Um, so one thing with model training is that there's a few different kind of patterns. We're trying to aim for that good fit robust in the middle where the model is most of the time getting the answer correct. Um, if, it's, if it's underfitted or if it's overfitted, uh, two different sort of uh, sides of the, of the sword, Underfitted means that it's going to generally be, be wrong. Quite often it works uh, okay with the training data, but it's terrible with uh, new data. Uh, overfitted works perfectly with your training data, but new data, it's, it's hopeless. So it's actually built a model that matches exactly the existing data, no ability to carry that forward. So if you've got a model that works, knitting it into a data pipeline isn't too difficult. The Lambda architecture is kind of falling out of favor these days, but it's a reasonable reference architecture that most people are familiar with, where along the top we have uh, kind of our batch processing data that occurs every night and brings our dashboards up to date. And we have a speed layer along the bottom, which is a sort of streaming, and that's, that's the delta. So everything that's occurred since the batch layer was processed, we're now adding in and mixing it together to get our kind of up-to-date dashboards. And you can hook the machine learning model right into that stream. So as the data is coming in through your stream, you can send off, get an inference, and start feeding that into the data. And that could be particularly useful, say, if you're an e-commerce platform, you've trained a model about the likelihood of somebody making a purchase. Um, you might have some indicators in your data, maybe the length of time that something's in a basket correlates to the likelihood of purchase. Uh, one customer I worked with found that there's a kind of a mark around about 10 minutes where uh, after that, the likelihood of purchase just tapers right off. The thinking is that there's an impulse buy going on. So if somebody adds something in the basket and in 10 minutes kind of then, you know, goes and makes the purchase, it's that kind of impulse purchase, like if you pick up sweets at the till in a, in a shop. Um, but when you get past that 10 minute mark, you're sort of into this, uh, oh, maybe, maybe I can't afford that this month, maybe I shouldn't you know, spend the money. So if you can pick that up with your, your model, um, you can do something about that. So at maybe at the 15 minute mark, you show up a coupon that says, if you purchase in the next five minutes, we'll give you a 10% discount and you know, entice them back in to make the purchase. So here we are. We've got a bot in Slack making predictions off of that machine learned model. So uh, PagerDuty hook calls this Lambda function in, um, which then calls another function that writes out to Slack. We've picked up a new incident. Uh, and in this particular case, I was on call. At least it's 8.19 in the morning, but still. Um, the model predicts a 77% chance that that's going to resolve within three minutes. And in fact, it did, 50 seconds. So you know, there's a, a separate conversation to do with tuning these alerts and getting rid of the flappiness. But the key is that we've got something in our data. Uh, the challenge for us is that every time we get a new customer, you have to repeat the tuning. Uh, there's a certain amount, certain thresholds. Uh, you know, the SLA monitoring is where ideally you want to be, but typically you start with the kind of simple endpoint monitoring. Uh, if you have a robust um, deployment process where you're kind of rolling out the same checks across all customers, this actually comes in handy. When we're now in the pattern where we can go, well, a bot is absorbing this, we're not disturbing our engineers needlessly, but we can at least see, here's some noisy checks that we need to tune out for this particular um, customer. So 77% accuracy isn't that fantastic. Um, this is where we move into the sort of raw ingredients where you roll your own uh, model, uh, you work out which particular algorithm you want to use, maybe a, a random forest or uh, you're going to do some deep learning with TensorFlow or Keras or something like that. And you, you take all that data uh, and you, you do your feature engineering um, and build that more robust sort of model. Now, I'm not going to go into a great detail on, on SageMaker. There's a talk in the expert track this afternoon, unless the schedule's changed, um, that's going to be talking about SageMaker. 
but um, the big piece is there's a hosted Jupyter notebook, and this is where you can start really doing that, uh, that feature engineering piece. So where we had some of those categorical variables, this is your kind of what they call one-hot encoding, where we add an attribute for each of the different categories and it becomes a binary flag. And in some models, that can be a huge indicator. So in this case, these are our different pager teams named after uh, video game characters. Uh, I'm on Sonic for what it's worth. And we can then just give an indication to the model. Now, as it turned out, when I did this initial analysis of the data, it really was uh, Mario and Sonic at the pager games. Um, the other two teams were not so noisy. It was these two particular teams that really had the issue. And this came to light because there was talk about me moving to Mario, and I had this impression that Mario was worse than Sonic. Actually, it was the other way around. I was already on the worst in terms of notifications team. So, okay, we'll do something you know, about it. Um, so, there's lots of different things you can do with the feature, feature engineering. Um, the, you can do linear or logarithmic transforms. Uh, you can scale the values. Various models are more sensitive to, to others if you've got um, numeric values that have huge values in scale. There's a fantastic book from O'Reilly simply called Feature Engineering. If, if that's not something that you're particularly familiar with, it really is worth going into. It does delve into the math if that interests you, but don't feel intimidated by that math if, uh, if like me, your math has hardly been touched since you left university. Um, it's, you can see what they're doing in scikit-learn typically uh, and go, okay, I understand that from a code perspective. I can apply that and see you know, what the impact is. So, that's all that I really wanted to, to sort of share with you. Um, any questions? It's feature engineering um, from O'Reilly. The author is Alice Zeng. Any other questions? Yes. It is to a large extent. Um, I'm, I would guess, a bit old school. I like static type languages. Um, and two reasons for it. There's a number of particularly um, typos that you can pick up, particularly if you're working with responses from APIs that you're not too familiar with, where if you're take, taking like a JSON document in Python or JavaScript, um, you can accidentally mistype a value and you don't find that out until you're running the function. Um, with Go, the JSON gets turned into structs, which you can then programmatically interrogate. And so at compile time, you know that you haven't got that category of error. Um, if you've got a decent IDE, it's also really useful for exploring the API. So if you're using a new uh, service that you're not you know, that familiar with in AWS, you can you either have to go through all the documentation or you can just take the service object from the SDK, control space, at least in Goland, and you'll get a list of all the possible functions that you can invoke. And so you can explore the API just you know, programmatically, which works really well if you've got I've got this data and I want to do something with. This will show me that these are valid things I can do in this particular context. Um, the drawback is that you've got to compile the Go before you can upload it. Um, that, for depending on your environment, can or cannot be a, a problem. With uh, my environment, most people are not developers, so they don't have Go uh, set up. So I end up checking in compiled binaries for them to, uh, to use if they want to deploy the stuff I've built. Um, one of our guys has been looking at setting up a code deploy pipeline as part of Terraform, so a module that would allow you to take Go code, run it through a code um, deploy pipeline, get the Lambda function deployed, and then remove that dependency. Uh, and, but that also applies for Python, where we've got issues with people having different uh, versions of libraries installed where you might not get necessarily the isolation you want, um, those, those sorts of issues. So, so yeah, personal preference. Any other questions?
Yeah. Um, so, you know, the deep racer is an, in, an interesting way in, and you can do stuff with it without having the actual uh, device itself. I don't think it's even available in the UK yet. Um, so you can you can sort of learn about reinforcement learning. Uh, you can run the models. There's like a simulated track where you can you can do that. Um, another interesting place to explore is Kaggle. Uh, yeah, it's K A G G L E. There's competitions on there, but there's also a lot of sort of historic kind of tutorial stroke. Here's kind of like challenges for you you to do, um, and you can go and have a look at those and get ideas and see. Well, this is how I might you know, string something um, together, uh, and just yeah, play. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Be around all day. Obviously, if you have anything, you think of something else, um, please do come say hi. Uh, and uh, oh, I've got a, a, a book of uh, Sudoku puzzles as well if you don't happen to have one to hand. So um, thank you very much.